Welcome back, everybody, to this edition of The Retrograde right here on Dead Jester Cinema. What is The Retrograde? Well, we're going to go through an old movie, and then when it's all done, I break that movie down into four categories, plot, characters, direction, and music, and I assign a letter grade to each of those categories, and when it's all said and done, I take the sum total of those letter grades and come up with an overall score for the entire film. And on this edition, we're going to be looking at the 1992 sequel to the original Children of the Corn, Children of the Corn 2, The Final Sacrifice. You know, I find it funny that they decided to franchise this thing like a whole eight years after the original. I also find it funny that only two films in and we're already getting The Final Sacrifice. I mean, who the hell came up with that idea? You know, I like the original title for this movie better. It was originally supposed to be called Deadly Harvest, so... You know, whoever made that decision sure knew what they were doing. And once again, I want to thank everybody who has helped get this channel to 1,000 subscribers. I am just so humbled and eternally grateful for that. And let's just keep the ball rolling. But anyways, kids, strap in because we are in for a bumpy ride. The film opens up in the town of Gatlin, where bodies of some of the murdered adults have been discovered and the remaining children are being shipped off to foster homes in the neighboring town of Hemingford. That is when we are introduced to John, a reporter, and his son Danny. But this father and son duo seem to be on the outs with one another as they head to Gatlin so John can get his big story. But before reaching Gatlin, John runs into some of his old reporter buddies of his and after a brief chat, the reporters go all stupid and get lost in the cornfield. And instead of just simply turning around and going back the way they came, they continue to be stupid and die. Damn, such a loss too. Back in town, John, desperate to get his story, runs into Angela, who is taking in one of the Gatlin kids, Micah. And after failing to get anything out of Micah at dinner, John and Danny have a loving father and son chat. So loving, in fact, that Danny decides he's taking his talents out of town. But holy shit, I guess evil children aren't the only thing to fear now, as it looks like the Predator has shown up too. Actually, that's just the stupid vision effect they use for He Who Walks Behind the Rose, and they abuse the hell out of it in this movie. Beautiful, isn't it? Anyway, insert Lacey, aka love interest number two. And suddenly, Danny has a change of heart and decides his breast course of action might be to stay in town. Later on that night, Micah wanders out into the cornfield looking for some friends to play flashlight tag with when he gets possessed! Yay! This new and improved Micah tells the Gatling kids that it's time to get busy with killing all the adults in Hemingford. First, they drop a house on an old lady Wizard of Oz style, literally. And thanks to some voodoo doll action, victim number two starts bleeding Kool-Aid uncontrollably like a faucet until he dies. Actually, I can't fully knock that kill because it is pretty grisly. Meanwhile, John is snooping around an abandoned school where he runs into Frank Redbear, a local Native American historian who insults John and his whiteness before dropping some lore knowledge on his ass. That not all might be right with the kids in town, and the kids aren't alright as they encircle and kill victim number three, the town doctor. But aw, look, they gave him a sucker. That was nice. That evening, as John is getting busy harvesting Angela's crops, Danny sees the kids playing flashlight tag out in the cornfield and is like, Hey, that looks like some fun! But he unwittingly stumbles into one of Micah's PowerPoint presentations, and when pressured, he sheepishly decides he's going to join the club. And the award for Clueless Dumbass Pushover of the Year goes to... Danny! Congratulations, Danny. That is a well-deserved honor. You deserve it. Nobody has done it better. The next day, Micah and the kids are back to their usual tricks by going after the sister of the wicked bitch of the East in her wheelchair. But this ain't the 80s anymore. This is the mother effing 90s, and Micah's playing with power as he remote controls the old lady's wheelchair right into the path of a semi-truck and... Yeah! <laughs> Oh god! Oh god! Oh god! I gotta see that again. <laughs> oh, oh. One more time. <laughs> oh shit! Bingo. After nearly dying in a shitty subplot that we will talk about later, John and Red Bear discover the bodies of his reporter buddies in the cornfield, as the rest of the overacting townsfolk are locked in their town hall shack and burned alive. Eh, 
no big loss there. Meanwhile, back in the cornfield, the final sacrifice has commenced, and in order to prove himself to Micah, Danny must kill Lacey and Angela as a sacrifice to he who walks behind the rose. But Danny has a change of heart, and he decides to renege on his and Micah's previous agreement. And with a little help from John, Red Bear, and a giant combine harvester, the quartet flee into the corn as Red Bear takes one for the team and dies. Aww. After getting turned around in the old corn maze, the quartet are confronted by Micah, who starts summoning the power of Thor or some shit, but he isn't watching where his robes are at, and they end up getting caught in the harvester's blades, and that's when Micah... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they didn't. No, they didn't. <laughs> look, look at him. Look at him. Oh, he looks like a little puppy dog. Oh. Uh, anyway... Micah snaps out of being possessed just in time to die as the quartet survive the rest of the night and ride off into the sunrise. And that, mercifully, was Children of the Corn 2, The Final Sacrifice. How does it stack up in the retrograder? Well, let's shuck this shit nugget and find out. The plot gets an overall D+. Is it bad in concept? No. Is it bad in execution? Yes. It's hard to stretch the plot of the original out into multiple films, so I can't fully knock them for what amounts to an almost copy and paste job, but they changed enough of the variables to make it just a wee bit different. And hey, this is from a guy who loves franchises like Friday the 13th and Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street, so I'm all for repetition as long as it's good. But again, it all boils down to execution, which was very, very weak. The overall tone is very unbalanced, especially with some of the characters. It feels more campy and silly than it does scary. And I'm all for camp, but this movie really sort of struggles with the direction it wants to go. Like, on one hand, it tries to scare you, but on the other hand, it, like, wants to make you laugh. And I'm just of the belief you need to find a lane and stick to it. The timeline between the original and this is dubious at best, and it's never clearly addressed, and that leads to some of the confusion as well. Plus, there's a whole subplot with toxic corn and fraudulent harvests that are both superfluous and non-sequiturs. It's a completely unnecessary sidetrack that has absolutely no payoff to the story, which is why I didn't mention it earlier. It also attempts to retcon lore, kind of, sort of, by saying this toxic corn mold who causes hallucinations in the children. Now I'm not sure, but these don't look like hallucinations. It's all just f***ing stupid. The characters in this all get another D+. The dad and the son were the only really decent good things going for this movie, but that's not saying much. Lacey and Angela are about as two-dimensionally shallow as the arcs their characters go through, and it seems like their only real purpose is to serve as f toys for the two male leads. They add nor advance nothing in the story, except some poor attempts at love angles. And Angela, shoulder pads under a t-shirt? I mean, come on, even for the 90s, that's a wardrobe fail. As the main antagonist, Micah has his moments where he is okay, and you could see there is an interesting character trapped in there somewhere, but it's all drowned out by his constant screaming and yelling. I don't usually mind over-the-top performances, especially in horror movies such as this one, but this pushes the envelope to the point of annoyance. The rest of the Gatlin kids are about as interesting as stale bread. None of them stand out at all. And along with Micah, they all feel like Wish versions of the original kids from the first movie. The other side characters, mainly comprising the local townsfolk, are all cringy overactors. Like bad community theater overacting. It's so bad that you start questioning if it's all on purpose or do they actually think that this is good. And I almost forgot about Red Bear, the stereotypical Native American sage in this movie. I really wanted to like him because he does have some pretty decent moments with the dad, but they made him stupid like the rest of the adults, and that just undercuts him as a character, and much like everybody else, he just gets lost in a sea of mediocrity. The direction gets a piss poor D-. It's actually so blasé that it's making me reconsider the grade I gave the original for directing because, in comparison, the original looks like frickin' Hitchcock. Every single shot in this movie is so flat and lifeless and uninteresting that it feels like a poorly made, made-for-TV movie. 
And because of that, it really lacks that atmosphere and creep factor that made the original so good. Now I get that this is a Children of the Corn sequel from 1992, so my bar of expectations was not that high to begin with, but somehow, somehow this movie managed to crawl in even under that low bar of expectation. Plus, this section gets a big strike for reusing shots from the original. Reusing shots is a big pet peeve of mine, even when it's done in the same film, but ripping off shots from a previous movie and then recontextualizing them for this one and doing it so blatantly just grinds my gears. There are shots during the climax of this movie that are clearly recycled from the original. And no matter how you justify it, it's just lazy, lazy filmmaking. And don't get it twisted, that was a directorial decision made in post. You know, they easily, easily could have gone anywhere and gotten those insert shots on the cheap. And judging by the budget of this movie, that would have been more than enough. But no, they decided to take the easy way out and just use footage from the previous movie, hoping that nobody would notice because it's been eight years. Oh, that's just so, so damn lazy. Finally, the music gets an all-around grade of a C, which is the highest grade this film gets. But again, that's not really saying much because some of this sounds good. The other stuff sounds good as well, but it sounds completely out of place. The title theme, for instance, is more befitting an Asian kung fu movie, not a horror movie about possessed children killing adults. And much like the tonal imbalance that I mentioned before, this also is a big part of that. Because there are parts of this score which vaguely echo the music from the original, but when you intersperse that with this tranquil and soothing sounding music that belongs in a spa, or a completely different movie, it's jarring. You know, it just makes me wonder because that score by Jonathan Elias to the original was so damn good that why not just either use that again or just do more of that. But I don't know, that music was so good and so creepy that I don't think it would have worked over this shit. With those four categories graded up, that brings the cumulative total up to a 68.25 and I'm not gonna round up and I'm not gonna round down because this film really doesn't deserve it. So that brings the overall grade to Children of the Corn to the final sacrifice out to a D plus. It's been about 17 years since I saw this movie and I forgot just how bad it was. And it's not even so bad that it's good, it's just painfully mediocre and boring levels of bad. A barely serviceable script that only halfway makes sense, characters that go nowhere and do nothing, or ones that chew the scenery like they're starving. Bland direction and fairly average music, not bad enough to warrant an F grade, but just passable enough to warrant a D+. Again, Nothing absolutely terrible, but it's easily forgettable. And that, kids, was this edition of the Retrograde. What are your thoughts on Children of the Corn 2? Uh, if you have seen it, please post your comments below. Do you think I've graded it fairly? Uh, would you have graded it higher? Would you have graded it lower? Let me know in the comments below. And once again, can't beat this dead horse enough, but thank you to everybody that has gotten me to 1,000 subscribers. I am just so, so grateful for that. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm just humbled by it. So once again, thanks. Anyways, leave your comments below and be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Adios and GTFO.